successful technical capacity building. Um, we all know that building strong tech capabilities, organizations, and workforce um, are the key to strong capacity building and cyber capacity building. Um, but it takes more than just training for skills, um, new equipment, policies, and plans to achieve a real lasting impact. Um, across the last couple days, across the last couple GFCE meetings, you're always hearing about sustainability. Um, and to create that lasting impact, it really takes a community. It takes a village. Um, it takes organically developed communities, locally driven communities, and operational communities of practice coming together. Um, these communities can connect practitioners. They can build networks of trust, um, are a platform for in information sharing, a platform for ongoing professional development, and they can capture the enthusiasm and the passion of communities um, to address common local, regional, and even international challenges. Um, what's critical, um, and often the challenges when it comes to capacity building in this space, is these communities are often extremely informal. Um, they often are working behind the scenes. They're bottom up, and their success is not measured by clean metrics like projects and photo ops. Um, these communities are often lost in the 10 different sessions that are happening in a, in, in a cyber capacity building conference or hidden behind the photo ops of big projects and big launches. But that doesn't mean they're not absolutely critical for having that impact. Um, and part of that criticality is that passion. Um, and for better or worse, it might be a little bit dangerous. We have a shocking amount of passion up here on the stage. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it. We're just going to have an informal conversation. Each one of our panelists will have a quick two to five minutes just to let us know who they are, what community they're coming from, and what they've been up to. Um, and then we're just going to jump into the conversation and hopefully open it up to all of you in the room as well. So we're going to kick it off in the Philippines, um, just right in the middle of the room. Um, tell us what you've been up to. This is all well, sorry, <laughs> proper introduction. Okay, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm from the Philippines. I'm Aluel Mulsid. Actually, I'm a government employee. I, I'm one of the workforce from the National Computer Emergency Response Team of the Philippines. So I lead the incident response uh, section, which means any cyber incident happening in the Philippines, as long as we detected it we, or reported to us, um, it goes to my section and uh, I'm, our team uh, is the one uh, responding to, to, to these incidents, be it uh, remotely or on site. Now, but my uh, purpose here is different. Um, I build a community actually a weekend community because uh, my engagement uh, uh, through my daily work, uh, I observed that there, there, there are uh, workforce from the government who wanted to attend training on, a, on, on the weekdays, but unfortunately, due to, of course, lack of uh, manpower, so usually they, they, they cannot leave their posts. So they miss uh, some important trainings uh, which available uh, in certain days during a weekday. But so with, with this observation and with this uh, discussion with, uh, with some of this uh, workforce from the government, I've decided to create a community on a weekend. So I, I attempted to, to, to have a training session on a weekend. And I was surprised um, this community um, were really appreciated by workers from the government, and I, I call this community a, the PH Cyber Units. So there, um, it started with accommodating uh, government uh, employees uh, who want to upskill from IT going to cybersecurity. Then eventually, we moved to uh, more uh, other programs like um, women cybersecurity, uh, shifting careers uh, who want to embrace uh, the, the path to cybersecurity careers. So that's all. That's all. Thank you very much.
Philippines. Um, we're just going to shift to a close neighbor, a relatively close neighbor to the Philippines. Um, Leticia, um, tell us about what you have going on in the Solomon Islands, and maybe you could give also a bit more perspective on a wider regional picture, because I know you've been working a lot across the Pacific as well. Hello. Okay, working. Thanks, Clay. Um, yeah, Leticia, I work for Foreign Fisheries Agency, but I'm here as part of um, Women in IT, Solomon Islands and the IT society. So um, cybersecurity is something new for us um, with C and each C. So there's um, very little, a few number of us that are working in this space, cybersecurity. But some of the activities that we're involved in is um, cyber hygiene, um, trying to do cybersecurity awareness, also trying to get some of our folks to upgrade to, um, to do programs like cybersecurity ambassadors so that we have people that are in the society that can help us roll out some of the programs that we have um, with schools on um, Get Safe Online, uh, just helping out young girls especially um, on how to be smart when using the internet. Um, because of our very limited uh, resources, we also pull from um, our friends in the region, in the Pacific. So this is like, we pull from women, uh, Tonga Women in IT tweet. We work with the Samoan uh, IT Society, um, PNG ICT cluster, just to get, um, make use of the resources we have around the region, just to help us run some of the activities on um, cybersecurity that we have going around in the region. So that's basically from me. <laughs> Cool, thanks for introducing us to what's happening in the Pacific. Um, we're gonna jump from the Pacific um, to another grouping of islands um, in the Bahamas, uh, Samatria. Um, you know, we talk a lot about communities and how they can help, um, and all of us understand being part of these communities, kind of that value that brings. But of course, with decision makers um, and policy makers um, and those outside the community, sometimes it's hard to see that value. Um, I know you've been doing some really interesting work um, to shape up how you're going to engage um, and show that value in your day job. Um, could you share a bit about what's happening in the Bahamas? Certainly, Clay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, to start, I want to say that I am from... Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Much better. Thank you. First up, I want to say my name is Symmetria McKinney, and I am the director of the Computer Incident Response Team for the Bahamas. Uh, so shout out to CERT BS, they are watching, and I want to make sure that they know that I care. Uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing, most importantly, is the CERT is recently established, and along with that is the approval of a recently approved national cybersecurity strategy, and to drive the development of that strategy and the establishment of the CERT required a lot of informal engagement, both formal and informal, but what we have developed at the, at the national CERT is is what we are calling a trust strategy. And we're using the 4C trust strategy. We're engaging with our stakeholders and showing them and asking them, what do you care about? So if, for example, we, we did tons of stakeholder engagement meetings. And during those meetings, we, we wanted to know what do you care about and how do you care to see cybersecurity established and develop within the country. Uh, after that, we wanted to make sure that we were constantly sharing information with them. Out of that was born the stakeholder engagement symposium where we constantly engage and the promise to our stakeholders is that we will take you on the journey with us to not only establish the national cert that will serve you but also uh, take you on the journey of developing the strategy and then of course implementing the, st the strategy that will lay out the roadmap for a robust cybersecurity society in the Bahamas. Sorry, we're running out of mics. We have to <laughs> keep shifting across. Um, and last but not least, um, we're going to shift to someone a bit more local um, and also with a few too many hats, maybe. Um, in your perspective, uh, former government, um, currently working with the private sector, but also super engaged with local communities as well as the global incident response community. Um, can you share a bit of that perspective on the different levels of community 
um, and how they factor in in the different perspectives there. Thank you very much, Clay. My name is Audrey Nisimreku. I'm with the Ghana Association of Banks. He's, he mentioned that I wear a number of hats. So I'm with the Ghana Association of Banks. Um, I'm also with uh, the Women of First. I'm also with the uh, Women in Cybersecurity West Africa. So women, of, um, women in Cybersecurity, we are um, a group of women who recruit retain and advance women in cybersecurity. Basically, we are a sisterhood. And my other hat, of course, is um, I serve in the board for the first, uh, for first, first.org, which is the forum for incident response teams. So all the incident response teams you see across the world, the national certs, um, I, I serve in the board where we basically try and ensure that we mobilize all their operations and we have resources all over across uh, the world. And we're trying to recruit more African teams and other regions which are represented into the forum of incident response teams. Back to your question, Claire. In my experience where I work with private sector, so I'm one of the few people who decided that I'll leave public sec private sector and go and join a public sector. A lot of people thought I was very crazy. I left my good job and I went to join the cyber security center. Worked with Dr. Albert, you uh, worked with the Minister for Communications. She was very passionate. There's no way I wanted to miss out on that. So yes, I left private, private sector and I went to public sector. I learned a lot from that. And uh, being part of the team that actually helped in developing those uh, policies for the country, I actually understood where Ghana wants to go and why Ghana wants to bring the whole of Africa with them. And immediately after we launched our, we, we approved our legislations, I went back to private sector. Why? Because I knew, I knew that we need to implement those legislations and directives. So from where I am sitting today, especially when I was with the National Cyber Security Center, because I led the National CERT, we developed an ecosystem where we had to work with, the, with academia, we had to work with government, we had to work with the telcos. What I learned from there and what I still continue to try and practice to the end, I'd also throw it back at you that if you want to be successful in your cybersecurity capacity building, you actually have to build capacity first within your local environments and use the resources there. Take advantage of the networks that you have. Use net existing resources and try and communicate the vision. If the people understand where you want to go, they will definitely ride on and support your project. The minister always says, even though we're a regulator, we we'll definitely have to go out there and collaborate with the, with the public sector, with the private sector. That is exactly what we are doing in Ghana. We are collaborating with the public sector, and now that I'm with the private sector, we're still collaborating with the public sector, and we are seeing a lot of uh, improvement in terms of uh, capacity building in the country and in terms of maturity of the country. So where I wear my other hat for first now. I'm sure this, today, this morning you all heard the good news that we have first has partnered with the UK government in terms of building capacity for Africa. Um, my vision for that is for us to continue riding on the communities that are on the ground. The mistakes we've made before as Africans was to receive funding um, by our donors and they tell us what we need to implement. But here's a situation where we are on the ground and first is saying, I want to work with the local teams. I very much applaud that and I'd encourage all of you to reach out and let's work with you in terms of the existing uh, communities that are out there, the hubs that are out there, so that we develop our own, using our own, especially in terms of building capacity, because it does have to be long term. We don't want just to build, train, but we're building capacity, which means that we will definitely look, we're looking at training the trainers, because we're looking long term. If we train the trainers, there's a lot more we're going to get out of that, and we totally have to rely on existing structures and uh, make sure that we all understand where we want to go. Thank you. Thanks for such a, a strong vision right off, the, right off the bat there. It's really important, like you said, to, to build that community, work with local folks. Um, and it's, it's interesting, something you said echoed one of the working group discussions earlier. In working group B, that whole idea of helping people understand your vision so everyone knows where folks are coming from. 
Um, it's a really important place to start, um, but you need to build those connections first. You need to build that community first. And a lot of times that has to start real small and real informal. Um, Samitri, I know we've had a little bit of discussion about kind of that informal connection building just to get things started. Yes, Clay, thank you. But before I, I talk about informal communications and networking, I do want to piggyback on something that Audrey uh, talked about, about donorship and co-design of the initiatives or the offerings. So one of the things that I can say from my perspective and more importantly from the English-speaking Caribbean, when we, we have donors and they have asked and we are saying these are the things we're, ne we're needing, what's important for us is that they're scaled to the English-speaking Caribbean. They address the needs of the people and that we are part of the design of those offerings. And that goes a long way in making sure that we're effective in, our, in, in the task that we set out to do, but it also goes a long way in making sure that there's no duplication of resources and efforts. Um, so talking about um, informal communication, a part of that information can easily be grasped simply by communicating with us, and that does not have to come across in a very formal way. The way that the CERT currently engages with its local and regional stakeholders is that most times, if you know my personality, I, I will call you up and say, hi, I'm Sabitra McKinney. There, there have been times with donors specifically, I've said, I'm not exactly sure what I should be asking for. I know you're a donor, but let me tell you who I am, and let me tell you the amazing work that we're doing in the Bahamas, and then you tell me what's possible to ask for. That's one. The other way is to make sure that we provide information to our stakeholders in a way that it's clear that they can see themselves and buy in to, to the to what you're selling. And that necessarily doesn't come from a formal memo or a formal legislation. It comes from us breaking bread or sharing a drink, in our case, sharing a glass of wine, so that we can talk about what's important to us without the barriers of this kind of formal, very stringent um, prototype or framework. Cool, thank you so much. Um, I like that you mentioned a bottle of wine, or maybe just a glass of wine. Maybe I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself and thinking about the social. Um, I just kind of wanted to share a, a bit of an anecdote. Um, we have this awesome panel here, but we are missing one of our panelists, uh, Tugzo, um, from Mongolia Nog. Um, so we're not just talking about technical communities from the perspective of security, but also from network operators and other folks who are working in this space. Um, and it was just that. It was Mongolia, so it wasn't wine, it was vodka and beer. Um, but Mon Mongolia Nog came together through just a small informal gathering of people from really competitive telcos, grabbing beers together um, and just talking shop. That started, a few passionate people came together and without being overly biased, it's one of the most well-run dynamic Nogs in the entire Asia Pacific. It's five years old um, and it can start just from that sharing a drink um, the peer-to-peer -peer network versus the peer-to-peer -peer network if you're, if you're talking from the network operator's um, side of things. And just that small catalyst can oftentimes lead to great things. Um, so that's a really good way to build those connections to start. Um, but to move from connection to community, a lot of times that takes ongoing informal engagement. It takes a lot of work to understand what your community means and keeping them active and involved. Um, oh well, I know you've been doing a lot of that work um, as you build up the cyber units. Um, could you share a bit there? Yeah, okay. Um, um, I have a lot of um, success story on, on informal and actually uh, building a local community. When uh, PH cyber unit started, uh, imagine when um, when I conduct, when I uh, schedule the first face-to-face -face training, I specifically mention on the registration form that there is no lunch for this training. This is a whole day training, but I specifically mention that so that uh, they won't be expecting any lunch, uh, food or anything. But I was surprised. Uh, there were like more than 40 registration uh, who, who registered to the technical training. So uh, then, um, so that's one of the <laughs> informal uh, uh, events face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, then, uh, aside from, the, from this training, uh, we do have a monthly, um, monthly meetings. 
without really like the purpose of that monthly meeting is to get to know uh, the newer members, the newer volunteers uh, to the to the to, to the PH cyber units, and we just uh, sit, have a coffee, uh, talk about cybersecurity, talk about uh, their their cybersecurity path where they are interested in. So uh, this lasted uh, for a few years. Unfortunately, uh, COVID came, of course, but uh, online we also do uh, evening uh, meetings informally uh, just to check on, on, on their uh, status and their progress in, 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 their, in their passion and in cybersecurity. So uh, these people are, some of our volunteers are jobless. They really want to ship from a non-IT work to cybersecurity. So they invested time with us uh, discussing things informally. So, so far uh, it's, it worked uh, because right now we have like 40 full members. When we say full members, they trusted us. They paid the membership fee. Then we have also like more than uh, almost 200 uh, community registered uh, members. Uh, these are free but uh, they registered and they attend online, meet, uh, online trainings and, and even face-to-face -face training. That's, uh, that's, that I believe that's uh, uh, a wonderful experience for us, from us. Until such time, uh, we conducted a, this time, a formal uh, event, which, hap which happened last April. We have a conference uh, attended by 91 uh, uh, full members and, and non-members and attended a conference like this, and uh, we were happy that we were, we were able to really uh, conduct that, uh, conducted that uh, event. Uh, and moving on, we even registered the PS Cyber units to our local, uh, to our country uh, security exchange commission, and uh, we became a an official registered nonprofit organization. Oh, very cool. I like what Awin said. For me, I, when he mentioned that then COVID came, then we had to stop. It's the opposite for Ghana. When COVID came, it introduced Zoom, it introduced Teams, which we took advantage of. Today, we meet with, we meet with the girls and, and uh, women in cybersecurity. We're able to bring any resource anywhere in the world. Why? Because we'll be using Zoom and Teams. All we need to arrange is the right time for everybody to be able to join. So we, we, we need to also look at the opportunities that are, are available. We saw an opportunity when, when Teams was introduced around COVID, and it is working for us. Thank you. I know, that's crazy. Broadly, I want to add to what, what both of you are saying. Initially, I mentioned um, having this trust strategy, and it's based on this 4C, um, showing care and communication. And the, the other two portions of that C speaks to competency and consistency. And the reason why competency is so important is that those who you're trying to build a community with needs to feel like they're getting something. So you have to add value. And, and, and in both cases here, there's value added. And so there's value added. Your group, your community that you're building will start to trust you. And I, I've seen that within the Bahamas. So I'm not only am I reaching out, but now we've gotten to a space where people are reaching out to us and saying, hi, Simitri, we want to know about what you're doing because we care about cybersecurity in the Bahamas. So because somewhere in there, we're adding value. The other key point to the C is consistency. We've promised our stakeholders that we'll take them with us on the journey. And we've done that through a variety of, of mechanisms. But one was just providing simple cybersecurity hygiene tips, just monthly. This, we're not doing anything special. It's just, well, it's special, but nothing too, too hard. Just cybersecurity tips monthly, cybersecurity. So you know we're still here. We're behind the scenes. We're doing all this work. People process technology. We're drafting. We have all this work going on behind the scenes, but so that you know that we're still here and we still want you to be a part of our community and you can still engage with us, we are consistently engaging with you in whichever way you can. And that, in my opinion, is how to keep your community engaged. 
Yeah, I think that's, you, you raised two really important points there. One, that continuous engagement, ongoing engagement, but also that sometimes it's just all the small things that come together to, to make things work. Um, what we've seen oftentimes are, there's sometimes folks come in and try to create a community rather than fostering a community. So they create all these fancy platforms um, where folks can have a forum, um, create mailing lists, create websites, create structures and things like that. And oftentimes that can stifle a community from starting. Um, whereas jumping on a Zoom call, grabbing a coffee, grabbing a wine, sometimes just those small interactions can be the, the most useful. Um, I kind of want to want to pick up on something else that you said about folks coming to you um, and that kind of dynamic shifting. I know in the Pacific, um, the work in the Solomons was a bit inspiring to, to some folks in the, in the rest of the region and folks came to you as well. Could you share a bit about that story? So um, for us, starting a woman in IT um, technology back home was, um, we've seen that there were very little, few of us in that space, female in that space. So it was uh, started just to inspire the next generation to come take an ICT career or come down that path. But then um, that's, um, and then sharing the career paths that you have as you, if, you, if you do ICT. And for s we've, we've got that inspiration from attending um, some of the technology meetings in Australia, so we decided to start that up. And then, um, amazingly, our friends, neighboring friends, also saw the uh, importance in that, in, uh, and then it inspired them as well. And then we started our activities. Now, studying those activities, some of the activities that I mentioned, actually needed funds to, to really run them. Um, but as you know, um, us in the island, we love volunteerism. So most of our, our activities are done um, during our spare times when we have free time to run the activities. And a little bit opposite from what uh, Alvin was saying, that you have no food on your... Um, um, training. <laughs> during training, for us in the islands, you said there's food provided and then the room will be packed. <laughs> so then that's how we run our training and our sessions and activities, yeah. Uh, Claire, can I uh, add? Uh, uh, actually, she mentioned, uh, Leticia, right, uh, mentioned about inspiration. Uh, honestly, we, what another informal thing we do, uh, the core member of PH Cyber Units, we, we are really like, uh, continue uh, uh, do uh, you know learnings, uh, taking exam of, of global accepted uh, certifications. Whenever we pass certification, we really announce this to the community because we want to let them know that we are serious in building this community. We are serious in uh, sharing this knowledge to them. So whenever there's a, a, a few months ago, we have like CISSP passer, we have uh, OSCP. We have uh, so some basic, the CompTI, CompTI plus, Security Plus and, and uh, some uh, IC Squared, the CC. We always announce these things because we want to inspire them that the, the core members, the, the, found, the founding members of, of PSA units, we are serious in, in, in this uh, building of community. We are learning and we are sharing to them. So, um, and in, in return, we, we saw that uh, whenever we announce these things, more and more people are interested in, in, uh, in, in attending to our uh, session, in, in, in joining the, 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 the community. Yeah, and uh, if I may just add, um, I think my colleagues in the region are doing a really good job doing um, cyber security trainings, awareness to schools, um, women in Tonga. Um, even the recent, um, uh, in October, we had all these cyber hygiene things going around on um, social media, trying to encourage our young girls, um, women, kids, on how to be cyber safe as well, and then developing the community cyber skills as well. So, um, applauding our people in the region for taking on board some of the things that I've learned. This is a warning to all our guests. In Ghana, if you meet a Ghanaian eating or a Ghanaian is going to eat, they say you are invited. Don't eat. <laughs> it's just a, a polite gesture. It doesn't mean come and eat my food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, what I'm trying to say with this is, when you, are, when you visit other places, I'm originally from Swaziland, so I came to Ghana, well, following love, I found myself here. So when I first came to Ghana, oh, Madame Audrey, we are invited. Oh, I was like, oh, these people are so generous. I was eating. But when the time came for me to share my food, oh, please, you are invited. Oh, no, no, it's okay, madam, you enjoy, enjoy. Everyone was saying that. It, this went on for a good two years. So I eventually asked one of my office girls, I'm like, how come when you guys offer me food, I eat? But when I offer, when I offer you food, you know, she says, oh, madam, we don't mean it. We don't, don't believe us when we say you're invited. It's just a thing we say. For me, where I come from, when somebody invites you to eat, it means that the person trusts you, you know. Back to our uh, point on uh, the point of discussion. When we're talking about building communities and the people, it's very important to understand the culture. It's very important to understand how things are done. There are so many things which are not written anywhere. You have to be on the ground to experience them. And for people to share information, there has to be trust. Based on that trust, it also determines the value of information that they're going to share with you. We talk about informal communication. There's the good side and the best side of informal communication. After I found my way around Ghana, I decided, okay, I know my way around. Ghanaians love foreigners. I took advantage of that. Did informal networking. I was able to get things done quicker than the Ghanaians, so I was really shining. But I realized that in our space of work, even though it's informal communication, oh, some of the data that you get out of that, you can't really use it because you can't repeat it in bigger platforms or you can't even include it in your report. But it gave us more insights of the threat landscape. It gave us more insight in terms of who is doing what and uh, should an opportunity come, we know who to go to. So it's very, very important to take advantage of, of informal communications, but there's a downside to it. This is better. So just so you know, at the start of this panel, Miss Audrey invited me to come to her house and stay. <laughs> See, she meant it, I'm not sure. <laughs> there you go with trust, right? Building trust and informal communication, okay. But, but I want, all fun to joke aside, I appreciate your point about not always being able to use information that you would gather informally. However, not for nothing, I think we have to appreciate the different types of information that we're asking for. Um, there are some information related to, because I mean, let me go back a little bit. I'm of the school of thought that I don't want to recreate something that already exists. I'm also of the school of thought that I want to be not only an ally, but a help to someone else. Because as someone who's newer in the cybersecurity space, as the Bahamas is relatively new in this space, uh, I've reached out to many of my colleagues in the region and, and they've provided information. Sometimes it's just a conversation. They're not sharing an actual document. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to one of my colleagues in the back, Mr. Angus from TT Cert. I called him many, many times and he has shared just, just a conversation and we're using that I've been able to take that information, use it without seeing the actual document. So I think there's, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can view that and we have to be careful about what we're asking for and then have an appreciation for how we can use the information that we've asked for. But there's, there's, there's room for both. Now, now about this invitation, <laughs> we can talk about this after the panel. So we know who the troublemakers up here are. <laughs> Um, but yeah, really good points about kind of the different types of information um, and the value of the informal and the formal. Um, that's really important to, to think about. Um, you're, you can have communities of informality in parallel with formal communities as well. I know in the Pacific we have both happening at the same time and certain types of information are being shared across one path, path with the same exact people um, who are on the other path. Um, but when you need the formality to be able to send it up to decision makers 
or to have the official sign off, you use one channel versus the other. So it's really interesting to, to have that interplay between different things. Um, I know we're kind of getting towards the end of the session. Um, and while we could talk for days about community, um, a lot of folks here at the conference are donors and implementers um, who want to engage with the community and work with the community um, and, and help it grow and foster. Um, and with that comes the challenge of designing programs, like some of you guys have mentioned, but also funding programs. I know that's one challenge that, that you wanted to mention um, from the Solomons, um, kind of that, that challenge of, of how do you deal with it? Um, so, like, like we all know, fund is the stimulus of growth for any community. And um, when funds are channeled through the local communities, um, it would be good if funds are channeled through the local communities themselves. Because I think uh, some of my colleagues here mentioned that we, the community knows the landscape, the literacy landscape, the language, um, the target groups, and stuff like that. So, um, presentation is key when you go into the communities, and own, um, local communities would know how to do that. Um, local communities are also well established. So you talked about trust. Um, our local people will trust the local community if they are doing the activities. They trust them that they will be doing a good job in running the activities that will be rolled out to in the community. Uh, there's also something that obviously when rolling out these activities, we have to seek for funding opportunities. And the, one of the challenges is um, some of the funding opportunities um, that you, we tapped into have their own requirements, um, have their own priority needs as well. So um, it would be good to tailor it to the needs of the local community and what they are trying to achieve at the lower level. Um, sometimes there are also co-application funding, but then at the end of the day, um, it's not we are fully realized by the co-applicant. Um, there are also some local communities are used as um, conduit for channeling funds um, for other projects. And sometimes it is difficult to access funds, especially uh, when it goes through the governments as well, because they also have their own processes in place on how to access the funds. Um, so local communities do have their own high priority areas and it's in the community. Um, and the, we also have volunteers that serve in the communities, therefore establishing a mutual partnership um, with, um, in a stakeholder approach, I would say, um, on channeling funds through the grassroots. I'm, I'm sure it's very important so that we support both the technical and the non-technical um, cyber capacity um, efforts, which is locally and regionally, or it can also be um, globally. Because remember, like we usually say, uh, like they say, that um, the community is only a community when it is driven by the community. Um, uh, I just want to add uh, our challenges in terms of funding. Uh, when, when I started PA units in 2019, um, I used my own fund to, to rent venue that can uh, cater 30 to 40 people. Uh, that happened uh, eight to nine times in that year alone, but uh, it's the, that's a hindrance actually, because instead of every month we can do uh, weekend trainings, we, we have a problem sometimes with, uh, with venue because we need to, I need to uh, use my own personal fund just to have a continuous event, training events for the government workforce who, who, who cannot attend weekdays training but they are available on the weekend. That's the purpose, the initial mission of, of, the, of the community. So um, fortunately, there, there, there is this uh, one member uh, volunteer who, who, who joined um, around during the pandemic, well, basically twin, uh, year 2020 or 2021. So since since uh, he joined, um, we, it's it's a, a good it's a blessing in disguise 
this person really also help help me in uh, in selling uh, or renting venue for 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 trainings. So, but but again, um, until now, um, this is the main uh, hindrance that instead we can conduct every month say high quality technical training. We cannot do that every month because of a fun issue. So we're still working on that. We're looking for ways on how to 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 fix these things because we really want to to uh, continue uh, inviting people, especially the members, uh, because our approach was uh, our our approach is we do this ladderize. Um, let's say uh, uh, two months ago you attended a basic networking uh, uh, coverage of the of the of the trainings. Then after two months, we, we introduce you to vulnerability assessment. Then later on, we do pen testing. Later on, we do even forensic investigation. Uh, resource, resource, uh, the advantage of our community is that we don't have problem with resource persons because most of the core members can deliver training. This, they, they are really, uh, really qualified in terms of skills, they work in a big companies. Um, they are uh, some of us comes from the national third of the Philippines. So it's it's an advantage in the uh, this is an advantage of the group. But again, we want a sustainable uh, you know community that we can really uh, capture and accommodate more requests from us. I think that's a, a very important kind of dimension that that you mentioned there. There's so much talent in all of our communities, in all of our countries. You can learn so much just from the person sitting next to you. And I know I'm learning a lot from, from all four of y'all. Um, so you, you can't forget that. That informal connection doesn't always have to come from the outside. Building that local capacity yeah. locally um, and together can be really important. Yes. Well, I, I think I want to go back to the idea of funding. Um, simply because I don't know anyone where funding isn't a challenge. We all have budgetary constraints. Uh, and I think going back to engaging and co-designing our offerings with vendors helps us to, like I mentioned before, not duplicate resources. But when we talk specifically about funding, I think that conversation also needs to be had with leadership. So it needs to be a trilateral conversation with you, the entity, your leadership group, and vendors, so that there's an understanding of, because I've had instances, let me finish that thought, so there's an understanding of what's priority and where this funding is, is going, like what's this funding for? Because uh, I've had situations where um, an organization, a vendor, or donor may be wanting to engage with us. But by the time, similar to my colleague, by the time it goes down the, the funnel to get to me, or through leadership to get to me, it's too late, or I've missed that opportunity, or that those opportunities aren't available. So while we are on our end going and lobbying with vendors for funding, for sponsorship, that that conversation needs to also be had with your leadership. It has to be one where you said, this is what we've done, this is the plan, this is what I'm hoping to get, or these are the things I've asked for so that when we come back to you with the needing approval or, or for example, when you see some information funneling down, you will be championing that, championing that on our behalf. I don't know. Hmm. When it comes to funding, I think yeah, like my colleagues have said, it's a, it's a big issue for all of us. And um, coming to think of it, I, don't, I haven't heard of any institution that's ready to dash out money. But at the same time, there is funding available. And uh, when it comes to capacity building, in my experience when you're dealing with um, fund donors and funders, they always want to measure the impact. How do we measure the impact of capacity building? It, mine is more like a question, I'm throwing it back at, at maybe even the floor, if Claire allows me. How are we supposed to measure the impact of capacity building? We've received the donor funds, and we have to show that there's been impact. If we don't work with communities, because I, I, 
I see a solution in working with communities because definitely if I work with communities, my neighbor would definitely come out and say, this my little girl is now a cybersecurity engineer and she's gone for an interview with Microsoft and uh, she's, she's gotten a job with Microsoft. There's something which is being done by um, cyber girls. And uh, I like what they do. Immediately, they, they, they initiate a set of girls, they train them in cybersecurity, they highlight their achievements, and uh, the girls are posted in big organizations. So it, it keeps you interested in seeing, okay, maybe we can measure capacity building, you know, because you definitely see the results. I think it's very, very important for us to also highlight it in our own small ways. Like, for example, let me give you a classic example. In our settings, we, we definitely know when we hear a set of drums that this particular drum is calling for a certain announcement. Each and every drum has its own unique announcement. So even when somebody is getting married, we know the kind of drum that is being uh, played. You know. I think it's, it's very important for us to also play that drum for the entire world to see and appreciate and not be measured on maybe the donor's expectations of how the funds will be used. Thank you. This is exactly what I was talking about, about co-design, when we're talking about what those offerings are. If we want to talk about measuring impact, then we have to decide what that looks like with you. Um, it, too many times, we I'm going to use the example of training. We may have a donor who's offering a, a training session or maybe a, a training symposium over a, a few days, and the, the topics or the subject matter is the same every year. But if we have the same people coming to that every year, then we're not really adding value in the way that the donor wants, nor are we getting the, the benefit of that as the, 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 the receiver, the donor, donor, okay, whatever that word is. Um, so the, the problem here is if we, are, if we are a part of the design, then what happens is we get to say to you, hi, we have a group of people who's going to be attending this training, and they are at an entry level this year. But next year, what we are requiring is more advanced training in these topics because not only are you you're a one donor, but we've also had some training over the years with some other donors, and we get to really tailor that. And then we can start to talk about um, measuring impact because we can see over the course of some years the growth for each employee specific to training. But if we're not a part of that design, then it's hard for us to start to measure the impact of those offerings. Yeah, that's a really great point. It's, it's, it's about moving beyond just consultation to find out what folks need and what folks want. But like you said, co-design, the active partnership to make things happen. And I think you mentioned another really, point, just really important point right there at the end, long term as well. Sometimes that impact is going to take years, months maybe, um, for, for, to show what might be measurable. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not worth it just because it takes, takes a long time. I do want to give the room a chance if they have any questions for these folks um, or if you have any ideas you want to answer the question about measurements and things like that. Um, did anyone have a, a question that they wanted to ask? Jump down. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm JD Dyer from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Uh, basically, mine is uh, a contribution uh, about uh, the approach in which uh, we can use to resolve issues pertaining to uh, cybersecurity. Basically, the existing approach has been government to government and government to cybersecurity agencies and association. Like, uh, please, the name, uh, McKinney. McKinney was saying, you know, when you are engaging the people, when you are engaging them, you get to know the resource and the capacity building impact that you have achieved. You get to know it. When you are dealing with government to government, it is that same data that they are going to collect to make their projections. So in our approach in resolving cybersecurity issues, whether 
in the cybersecurity gap, what I am suggesting is that we should have a lot of approaches. We shouldn't stick to one approach. If it is, uh, after having the collaboration, if it is a government to government collaboration, we should trigger it down. Government to cybersecurity societies and agencies. We should also go to the various communities because when we do that, the impact will be well fed. So that is what I would like to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, did anyone want to, to respond uh, or add? Uh, please allow me to, to add. Um, I just want to mention that um, our community, usually we, we do once a year survey. We, we, re, we specifically ask in the survey what specific challenges that you want to fix or to resolve. Like when we, when, when we say specific, uh, we, we ask um, specific systems if, if, they are if they have challenges in, uh, in their uh, defending their, their websites or their systems or their servers or their, uh, or, or their you know, your, their, their uh, work uh, test environment or production environment. We specifically ask that on a survey without really uh, asking them a uh, super specific answer. We just, we, we just want to know uh, their, their, the survey result so that as soon as we get this result, we, we analyze it and we create training materials for, for specific uh, result so that the next time we, we, we conduct uh, training, this is based on the the result of the survey because we want to immediately fix problem. This, this especially this is for the government workforce. We want to specific problem like if, if, uh, if the survey, uh, the result came out like they have a challenges in, uh, in defending from ransomware, we create training materials from about ransomware or about uh, web, web uh, or DDoS or web defacement, something like that. So specifically, we are targeting uh, uh, issues, giving specific solutions. I, no? Okay. <laughs> I like the idea about asking the people what skills they need to know. In, in some parts of my world, even if you ask them, we don't even know what is available. So it's also important for us to also learn from what is out there, then come and impact and share, which is why we normally have these um, webinars where we put somebody on a spotlight, like we'd reach out to Clay, come and join us this month, tell us about your career, how did you get there, what certifications do you have, you know? Because honestly, when you ask the girls in Hohe today, which is a, a somewhere up north in Ghana, they might not even know the kind of training they need, you know. So sometimes bringing in the resource person and showing them this is clear, this is what he does, it also opens up their, their mindsets in terms of, so this is available out there. I've, I'm still shocked every day when I meet new people, um, especially in conferences, that wow, so there's an opportunity. For ever, I've since realized that there's an, there's an matching role in cybersecurity for any traditional um, career there is out there. Be it lawyers, we need cybersecurity laws to de be developed, we need laws, uh, lawyers to represent us in courts when it comes to cyber uh, cases, be it uh, incident responders. And uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from the traditional rules and also even still some of the people and bring them into cybersecurity in our capacity building. When you look at the emergency response teams in hospitals, how they are so organized. Can you imagine if our incident response teams are that organized? Everybody knows what they need to do, and when the doctor comes, they hand over that note to that. Can you imagine how easy it would be for us in, in cybersecurity incident response if we follow that flow? So not only should we build capacity with uh, cybersecurity individuals, we should also poach from the other careers that are out there. Audrey, thank you for that point. My final comment is 
and you are a living testament of it, uh, all of us here on this panel, is that representation matters. And it's important for us to see, for others to see that these roles exist, to see us doing this work, excelling in the roles. It's important for, we talk a lot about women in cybersecurity and for girls and, and boys, for, for us to know that these types of roles exist and that we are doing them and there, there's room and space for everybody to not only perform but also be successful. Just one last thing. I think coming to this um, program, this event has also um, helped us create networks. So I'm happy that I'm here because I can now network with cyber women in cyber in Ghana <laughs> and bring that back to our, our, our Pacific Island country. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I was going to say if we could go through and have one last comment from, from everyone, but um, everyone uh, volunteered a last comment. Um, oh well, if you want to, to do your last comment as well. Okay, uh, I, I, I believe uh, when you create a local community uh, focusing on cybersecurity, uh, we need to define our mission. Like us, our, our mission, one of our mission is to, to, uh, to become a venue for government workforce or IT workforce in the government to move to or embrace cybersecurity skills. So that's one of our mission. Thank you. That's it. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Um, I know I've learned so much not only from this conversation, but even when we were just sitting down, and this was before the drinks, to discuss the planning for the panel, just the dynamics and the interesting things that we can learn from each other um, apply, sometimes in different cultural contexts. Um, and help grow communities of practice, bottom-up, organic, um, really empowering each other and learning from each other. Um, and like you guys said, this room is a community in and of, of itself, the GFCE community, the GC3B community. So I'm really excited to continue um, chatting with you guys, chatting with all of you, and hopefully we can share those lessons together. Thank you so much. Can we have another round of applause for these passionate, community-driven folks? Thanks so much. Um, I think we are relatively on time, um, and people probably are desperate for that coffee. Um, so thanks for joining the session. Um, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, sir. Oh, sure. Yeah, we we can have another question. Um, So the lights are in my face. Was it you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering because usually when you come to sessions like these, they make maybe five minutes for questions so that we all feel like we're part of the whole thing. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, okay, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I want to uh, appreciate all of you for your comments, your contributions, and uh, especially uh, the women who are pushing tech. I believe that um, Audrey had mentioned that there is money for women who want to go into tech. I want to hold your dress to that. Yes, because uh, there is so much that needs to be done when it comes to empowering women uh, financially because the, the money is out there, but we don't know how to access the money. So if you would have like a roadmap or a direction of how and where the money is, I will lead lots of women there. Because I, I, I run an organization called the Women in Leadership International, which has over 260 women in Ghana. And uh, we like to advocate for women and children, and we also like to uh, impact their lives. So I will be very happy, because when we go to the traditional banks, commercial banks, they're asking for so much, the paperwork scares everybody away. So if there is a roadmap which can lead some of us to money that is allocated to support women uh, to get into tech, uh, I'll be very happy to do that. Huh? Because, well, I'm, a lot of people know, my name is Reverend Dr. Nanaya Prempe. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, my name is very common in the 
IT industry because I was the first woman to start an internet company in Ghana, 1999. And I, I love um, impacting the younger generation so they can do what I couldn't do. And I cannot do that without money. I'm also the board chair for the Ghana Domain Name Registry. We need money also in that area to help the domain registry to stabilize because it's a new baby that we are nursing. And so I need money, money, money. So show me where to get the money. Thank you. If any donors in the room want to answer this question, um, they're very welcome to take the mic. But in the meantime, I don't know, you were put on the spot if you want to say one minute, one minute. She's actually my mentor. She's just putting me on the spot. <laughs> she knows I meant with our resources. When I mean resources, Doc, you know you can call me anytime so we can go talk to the girls. I can make two, uh, tool sets available. There's a global cyber alliance with all the fancy tools which we can actually uh, bring down to the girls, to the journalists. So the resources are there, Doc. Doc. Call me, we'll, we'll definitely make those resources available. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. And I, I think I can speak both uh, on, on your behalf, but also the whole panel, we are available to keep the conversation going. So like you said, call us, email us, text us if you're a millennial. Um, uh, so thank you, thank you again, and thank you for the comment.